Greetings from uh, Dubai. I'm Maher Abbas, and it's an honor and a privilege to be speaking at your conference uh, today. I've been tasked with a very important topic to uh, discuss endoscopic resection of large colorectal polyp and early uh, neoplasm. In this talk, I aim to cover four areas. I'll provide you with the overview of uh, colorectal cancer and polyp. I'll make the case of fine endoscopic resection today is a very uh, important part of our practices in colorectal surgery. I will share with you some of the technical aspect and result and use few case illustration uh, to demonstrate uh, this technique. Now first I'd like to share with you a uh, global perspective on colorectal cancer and polyp, uh, not only from a worldwide perspective, but also from United Arab uh, Emirates, I'll share with you some of the local data. This was uh, published last March 2021 by the World Health Organization. As you can see here, uh, the global impact of colorectal cancer, approximately uh, 2 million uh, cases, and it contributed to approximately a million deaths across the globe. It's important to know that this is a captured data. There are many countries that don't report uh, adequately or accurately, and therefore this may be an underestimate. But in general, a, approximately a million people are dying every year across the globe from colorectal cancer. And uh, when we look at the colorectum uh, base, it contributes to approximately 10% of all cancer mortality, with lung cancer being uh, the leading uh, cancer, uh, contributing to death, the colorectum uh, come uh, in a second position, approximately 1 in 10 patients. And this data is from the United States, where I practiced for many years. Uh, despite a significant effort in screening the American population, uh, colon rectal cancer remained both in men and women the third most common cancer in terms of estimated new cases, about 150,000 cases in the U.S., approximately 8% of all new cancer cases. And in terms of the estimated uh, death, uh, again, both in men and women, it's the third uh, leading uh, cancer death, accounting for approximately 10% of all cancer-related uh, death after prostate and lung in men and after lung and breast in women. Now, uh, more alarmingly, a study uh, released by the American Cancer uh, a society uh, comparing the generation born in 1950 compared to the generation born in 1990. There was a two-fold increase in risk of colon cancer in the younger generation and four-fold increase in the risk of developing rectal cancer over a lifetime. Uh, this very important and landmark uh, study basically changed our screening recommendation in the U.S. where we wanted to drop it down to 40 as the starting age of screening, but because of the um, lack of uh, adequate manpower to address uh, such a, an increase in screening, uh, we dropped it to 45, and this was endorsed by the American Society Colon Rectal Surgeon. Now, how about the region? Uh, the UAE is a young country, start collecting uh, data. In 2014, it um, reported the cancer incidence in the United Arab Emirates through an annual report. And um, when we look at both uh, men and women, women represented on the left side of the slide, the colon rectum accounted for 10% uh, of all uh, cancer cases in women after breast and thyroid. However, in men, it was the leading cause, um, contributing to 18% of new cancer diagnosis. And this is for uh, UAE nationals. Uh, but since the UAE has a very large population expat who are not uh, UAE born, uh, um, they looked also on the non-UAE citizen and very similar trend. Colorectum was the third leading uh, cancer in women and the uh, first uh, cancer in men in terms of incidence. But more importantly, and, and this was a great concern, is that over half of the cases present with either regional or distant metastatic disease, stage 3 disease in 28.8% and stage 4 disease in 23.2%. And uh, they, therefore, the challenge here is that many patients are presenting with an advanced stage of colorectal cancer and thus the importance of increasing screening in this population. 
And uh, this was from the World uh, Health Organization. Again, uh, the data from the UAE demonstrating that the colorectum contributing to approximately 10.6% uh, of uh, cancer cases in the country. This uh, was an observational study from uh, a group in Abu Dhabi where they uh, looked at uh, eight years of data. And uh, based on data from over 7,500 colonoscopy, they found that the average age of colorectal uh, cancer was 53 with 46% of cancer presenting below the age of 50 and 14% below the age of 40. I don't know what the trend is in your own country, but uh, this is certainly a much earlier onset of uh, colorectal cancer compared to the West. And in my personal experience looking at four years data, these are patients I've operated on. Uh, we deal with a younger population compared most Western countries um, uh, in, in the world. Uh, I operated on 56 patients. Uh, the majority of them were uh, expat, non-UAE national. Uh, they were predominance of uh, males with 36 uh, males. And the median age was 52 years of age with a mean age of 52 and a range of 31 to 83. So certainly my personal data on patients who are operable uh, was consistent with the general data across the UAE. And similarly to the national data, uh, stage three disease or stage four uh, disease uh, accounted for approximately 60% of all the patient. In terms of uh, oncologic uh, quality metric, I was able to achieve uh, uh, the standard of care that we see in Western country with a median lymph node harvest of 24 uh, lymph node. Uh, in the majority of patients, a median length of stay was also achieved with uh, three days with a range of 2 to 40. 40 was an outlier patient who sustained multiple uh, medical issues as well as an anastomotic leak. Now, uh, this uh, study from Lancet uh, looked at uh, a global perspective in various countries and uh, it analyzed data from 1990 to 2017. It came to the conclusion that colorectal cancer remained a substantial public health challenge across the globe. So this is not a either Western or a Gulf country perspective, but a global perspective. It, it remained a significant burden to healthcare system. As you see in these slides, uh, looking at data from 1990 and 2017, uh, the United Arab Emirates uh, ranked uh, basically third uh, in the Arab world, with Lebanon and Libya being the two countries with the highest incidence of uh, colorectal uh, cancer. The median age of presentation across the Arab world uh, is represented here, and as you see, uh, in men compared to the U.S., where it's 69 years of age, and France, where it's 72 years of age, the majority of Arab countries have a median age of diagnosis in the, either the 40s, uh, such as the UAE and Egypt, uh, to the 50s. So it tend to present a decade to two decades earlier compared to the West. And this data uh, is fairly similar in women, where the median age of presentation in the US is 73 years, France 75. But when we look at the UAE, it's 46, Egypt 50, and most of the rest of the Arab world is fairly similar. Again, presenting a decade to two decades earlier compared to the Western Hemisphere. Now, the etiology of colon cancer, we do know that the majority of it is sporadic without a strong family history. Traditionally, we quoted the patient uh, about 1% uh, related to IBD. 15% seen in families and approximately 4% uh, being hereditary running in families. Now, it's important to note that a recent study from the Mayo Clinic, uh, where I spent six years of my career, have shown that approximately 15% of uh, colorectal cancer uh, is inherited through uh, modern genetic technique. And because of um, the burden of colorectal cancer, the American Cancer Society um, changed uh, the screening recommendation. Now we screen patients between the age of 45 to 75. Um, a patient between the age of 76 to 85 can continue the screening taken into account 
uh, past uh, history of either polyp or cancer, overall health of the patient. And in general, uh, we tend not to advise screening for patient uh, older than uh, 85 years of age. Uh, this slide is in Arabic, but basically it's from the uh, Abu Dhabi Health Authority uh, that uh, shared basically that the majority of patients are presenting with colorectal cancer at an advanced stage. And a matter of fact, 63% of the uh, uh, patient in the registry in Abu Dhabi. And therefore, in the UAE, the recommendation is to start screening patients uh, at the age of 40. There are... Um, a standard uh, recommendation uh, similar to the West, except for the starting age of screening here is 40 to 75. If you remember from the slide from the American Cancer uh, Society, it started at 45. Here we tend to screen earlier. Uh, colonoscopy every 10 years or stool test uh, annually. And it's important that this is to note that this is part of a broader cancer screening program that involves other types of cancer, including breast and cervical cancer and lung cancer established in this country. Now, in terms of the screening program, it's important to know that uh, in your own country, uh, you, you need to have a specific screening program. In the UAE, uh, they are quality um, a performance indicator. Um, for instance, the screening uptake rate has to be a minimum of 55% of the population. Um, we talked here about the sequel intubation rate as a quality metric need to be achieved in over 90% of the patients undergoing, undergoing screening colonoscopy, the sequel need to be reached. A minimum uh, adenoma detection rate of 25% in male and 15% in female. Now I share this with you just to tell you that not only screening is important, but it's important to establish program with the national quality metrics so you know how you're doing within your own practices and environment. Now, uh, moving on, we, we do know that this is important because uh, most colorectal cancer go through a sequence um, named the adenoma to carcinoma sequence so through several uh, genetic modification. Uh, we start from normal uh, colonocyte epithelium, which gradually start proliferating through a series of uh, a genetic changes to becoming an adenomatous polyp and from there to becoming a cancer. Um, adenoma is in the top screen, cancer in the bottom part of the screen. Obviously, the sequence uh, typically occur between 8 and 12 years in most patients based on uh, prior data. So that gives us a tremendous opportunity to, uh, to screen patient and detect the lesion in an earlier uh, time. Now, is there uh, any data to suggest that increasing screening can alter uh, the presentation of colorectal cancer and change the mortality related to the cancer? This was one of the earliest study uh, published in the world. It's from my alma mater, the Mayo Clinic. Uh, some of you may be familiar, Mayo Clinic is the number one hospital in the United States. The uh, main campus of the Mayo Clinic is based in the southern Minnesota, the state of Minnesota, in a county called Olmsted. Uh, county. It's a county where there's not a lot of uh, movement. Uh, basically, most people are born, raised, and die in the same county, so they're able to capture a lot of good data. And in this study in the Mayo Clinic, they were able to look at the data for colorectal cancer in residents of Olmsted County between the year of 1980 to 1999. And during that period, what had happened in the county is there was an increasing rate of colorectal cancer screening. And as you can see, uh, for uh, Duke stage A, B, C, and D, this is the old classification for staging colorectal cancer, A being the equivalent of stage one, B, stage two, C, stage three, uh, and stage D is for stage four. What happened over the course of the study, they saw a decreased rate in presentation in stage four, which is Duke D, and an increased presentation in Duke A, which is stage one. So clearly something was happening in the Olmsted County where more cancers uh, were being captured in an earlier stage uh, as the study uh, went on over those two decades. And uh, not only uh, did they demonstrate um, increase in earlier stage, but also when they compared patient uh, whose cancer or which cancer was uh, detected by screening modality versus patient who have not been screened and came in with symptoms such as bleeding or obstruction, 
uh, the stage of presentation was uh, earlier in patient who got screened compared to a patient who came in symptomatically. So clearly, there was an effect to screening where uh, if you screen uh, patients, you discover more and more cancer in earlier phase when they're potentially uh, curable and easily treated. And that uh, basically impacted the overall survival uh, rate long term. The patient who'd been screened had a better survival rate compared to those who were not screened and came in symptomatic. Now, subsequent to the Mayo Clinic study, there was this study, the polypectomy study, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2012. It, uh, the, the graph here presents basically the cumulative colorectal cancer mortality and you have uh, three groups uh, the group in the red line the bottom line the flat line are patients who uh, were screened and uh, were found to have normal colonoscopy without adenomas uh, the second group which was the middle group in blue are patients who were screened and were discovered to have some adenomas that were removed versus the uh, trend of colorectal cancer in the general population so uh, if you were never screened, your risk of uh, dying from colorectal cancer was the highest. If you were screened and nothing was found was the lowest. And if you were screened and you had some adenomas removed, you uh, decreased the risk, but you did not completely eliminate the risk of uh, developing colorectal cancer. Now, uh, if you have interest in this topic of screening before we get to advanced polypectomy technique, you can refer to the National Cancer, uh, the NCCN guideline, which were last revised and published in 2020. And uh, this was uh, published in the, uh, the Journal of the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. And uh, that uh, basically based on that, the screening recommendation for the American Cancer Society in terms of how to screen patients, you could do a stool-based test, um, the FIT test every year. That's the fecal immunochemical test. This is the newer version of the old GUIAC test. Um, the nice thing about this test, it's a one stool sample compared to three stool sample with the previous studies, and you don't need to have much dietary modification uh, like the old test. Uh, you could also have the highly sensitive guiac-based fecal occult uh, blood test uh, that can also be every year. I typically prefer the FIT one. Uh, or you could have the multi-targeted stool DNA test done every three years. That's the ColoGuard. Some of you might have heard about that. It's a more expensive test and not widely available. Or you could do a visual inspection of the colon. The ideal is a colonoscopy every 10 years uh, for average risk population. Or a CT colonography is an alternative. Uh, that's what we call virtual colonoscopy every five years. Uh, if you don't have access to either modality, you could do flexible sigmoidoscopy every five years with yearly stool tests. Now, having provided you with a comprehensive uh, uh, background on uh, cancer and polyp across the globe and UAE, I would like to make the case for why endoscopic resection. Now, we do know that the natural history, as alluded to earlier, the adenoma to carcinoma sequence, uh, in most studies, 8 to 10 years. In this uh, particular graph, it's, uh, I show it 10 to 15 years even uh, in some studies. So we know it's a process that is very gradual and very slow. And we have a great opportunity along this continuum to catch the patient early at a time when they either curable surgically or potentially manage endoscopically. Now the ideal intervention uh, should be able to eradicate the polyp, avoid recurrence and prevent the development of cancer, cure early cancer if we can and minimize the morbidity of the procedure and be cost effective. Now, what is the problem with colorectal uh, resection? Um, John Bergmeier was a researcher at the University of Michigan who was interested in a lot of outcome-based study. The study published in the uh, Journal of the American College of Surgeons in 2008 looked at all the general surgical procedure and how much morbidity they contribute uh, to the overall spectrum. And as you see here, colectomy plus or minus colostomy contributed to 24% of all complication we saw in the field of general surgery and if you add the three percent of proctectomy uh, basically nearly one in three patients uh, uh, one in three patients who witness a or suffer from a complication in general surgery it's related to colon or rectal resection and thus 
even though we're a very good surgeon, we have a variety of techniques, including laparoscopic and minimally invasive technique. Uh, patients with colorectal resection still have a significant amount of morbidity. And I got involved with the therapeutic endoscopy when this patient showed up uh, in my office. She actually was a delightful lady, but she was in a wheelchair, had suffered a stroke, was in coagulation, and she needed colonic resection. As you can imagine, uh, even though this patient was motivated and nice, she was very limited. She was also obese and had multiple medical comorbidities. So you can only imagine uh, her type of length of stay and postoperative complication. Now, when it comes to endoscopic resection, I showed the um, polyp in the left upper uh, quadrant of the slide. Clearly, that polyp can be removed by any well-trained endoscopist today, but and. The lesion on the right side, that's the rectum of a patient has a giant villus adenoma. The needle holder is used as a reference. It's a adult size needle holder and you see the amount of tumor had completely replaced the rectum and thus we all would agree that such tumor cannot be removed endoscopically. But how about the um, picture in the bottom part of the slide, a tumor here in the rectum that have occupied three folds of the rectum and uh, included uh, over 50% of the circumference. Can we tackle those endoscopically? And this is a, a tumor I uh, recently um, interviewed on in December of this year. Uh, that tumor was uh, referred to me for right hemicolectomy. It was at the hepatic flexure. If I needed to resect it, it would have involved removing half uh, the patient uh, colon uh, as seen here. Now, I've been performing endoscopic resection uh, since the beginning of the century. Uh, this was my original series published in Archives of Surgery in 2011. Uh, this was a cohort of patients. Um, uh, there were uh, 104 consecutive patients who were referred for surgical intervention, and uh, either the patient had uh, too much uh, medical comorbidity or desired an alternative. As you can see here, 71 of these patients, 68% of the lesion were in the colon, with 32% in the ascending colon, 19% uh, in the cecum. So about half of the colonic lesion were in high-risk area where the risk of bleed or perforation is higher due to the thinness of the colon. And 32% had a rectal lesion, 38% um, uh, had a carcinoma. Uh, in situ, the majority in some early cancer, about 15%, a non carcinoma in 62%, and the majority of the lesion were sessile, 85%. The mean lesion size was 3.3 centimeters. So these were large uh, lesions, some as large as 9 centimeters. And uh, these are case illustration of rectal lesion. Um, the upper one is a tubular villus adenoma and the bottom one is a carcinoma in situ. Uh, the panel on the left is before resection. The panel on the right is after complete resection endoscopically in the endoscopy suite under intravenous sedation. Now, when I looked at the outcome of these patients, the overall endoscopic success rate was 83% were managed non-surgical. Important to note that 90% of these, I was able to accomplish the task with one session. In 11%, the patient needed a second or third procedure to complete the job. Uh, recurrence rate was 12%. Uh, percent. Uh, majority were managed uh, endoscopically. The overall complication rate was 7%, uh, 6% uh, related to bleeding, 1% perforation that required surgical intervention. The, all the bleeding patients were able to control endoscopically. No patient died in the series. The overall need for surgery was only 14%. Again, it's important to note that this group initially was referred for surgery. Uh, so the endoscopist who looked at the lesion said it cannot be done endoscopically. Uh, eventually, the majority of them were managed endoscopically. And uh, endoscopic intervention rate, uh, whether for bleeding or recurrence, was 27%. And this was during a mean follow-up of 14 months. Now, having presented to you uh, some of my personal results, what did some of the technical aspect and result of this technique? 
Uh, we have uh, several different techniques. We could do simple snare polypectomy. We could do piecemeal endoscopic resection. We can do endoscopic mucosal resection known as EMR. We could do endoscopic submucosal resection, ESD, or full thickness resection where we take the um, lesion and the bowel wall and then we close uh, the area. Now, a snare polypectomy is uh, widely available. Um, it's a suitable technique for uh, pedunculated polyps, such as the one shown here. It's fairly simple. Any um, a trained endoscopist can perform this uh, routinely. We typically use metal uh, snares uh, with heat. Uh, so it's a hot, basically, snare polypectomy. We have variable snares on the market. Uh, the shape and the size of the snare can vary. Uh, depending on the size of the polyp. Now, uh, endoscopic mucosal resection uh, is uh, more suitable for patients who have a flatter uh, lesion, and typically we aim at taking the lesion in one piece uh, by taking the lesion and surrounding mucosa, such as demonstrated in this slide. Uh, ESD is uh, where we go a little bit deeper. This technique was developed in Japan in 1990. It allowed for in-block resection of early stage upper GI cancer. The application started in 2006. I got involved in the early 2000 in this technique in the US and I was one of the few practitioners at the time offering this technique. It enables uh, in-block resection larger lesion, lesion greater than two centimeter. Uh, we have uh, instruments that allow for dissection in a deeper plane. The advantage is that you can retrieve the lesion in one piece, allowing for full histologic evaluation for the endoscopist and has been associated with a lower recurrence rate. And uh, this is a cartoon from my dear colleague, uh, Richard Whalen from New York, uh, basically demonstrating the plane in which we work. Unlike uh, uh, EMR, where we're in the mucosal plane, we're here in the, into the submucosal plane where we're creating a lift of the lesion and we go in that plane to uh, dissect off uh, the lesion. We have a variety of tools. Uh, the, the bulk of the tool currently are uh, designed for the upper GI. It's important to note that uh, one has to be careful when you use upper GI ESD instrumentation because the tip tend to be a little bit longer suited for the thicker uh, gastric wall. Uh, colorectal ESD tools are more limited, typically be shorter, but that's ideally what you want to get uh, hold of um, in order to perform this safely. But if you only have uh, gastric instrumentation, you have to be very careful when you use them. Uh, since uh, 15 years ago, the introduction of metal clip to close defect um, when these were introduced, it uh, provided us with a tool not only to close uh, some uh, colorectal defect, but also to provide the better hemostasis, hemostasis uh, and, and bleeding uh, control endoscopically. I would like uh, to share with you a, uh, a rectal adenoma with some carcinoma in situ that was resected um, endoscopically. And uh, here we see the lesion occupy a good percentage of the circumference of the uh, rectal wall. It's been infiltrated with saline, and we're taking here an endoscopic knife uh, into the uh, submucosal layer here. You can see uh, the fiber of the muscle are going to be a little bit uh, deeper. And uh, we go circumferentially where we can dissect off the lesion. Uh, often you have to um, re-inject uh, because the injection the, uh, will, uh, the swelling will go down as time goes uh, through the procedure and here we have a complete resection of the lesion and we're going to retrieve the lesion uh, transanally. We're going to pin it to a, uh, a specimen slide and send it for histologic evaluation and this is several months later you see an area of scar here. There's uh, no residual poly polyp at all. Now, uh, they have, there has been a lot of data coming from uh, Asia predominantly. This study over five years from Korea looked at EMR, EMRP, which is a specialized version of EMR versus ESD for lesions that are greater than uh, 20 meter. And clearly, when you compare these three techniques, uh, you can tackle larger lesion with ESD. Uh, 
So compared to a mean tumor size of 21.7 millimeter with the EMR, you can go to nearly 29 millimeter with the ASD technique. It allows you for more in block resection, 42.9% in EMR technique versus 92.7% in for ESD. Furthermore, the rate of complete resection is much higher in ESD, 87.6% compared to 32.9% with EMR. However, it's important to note that the complication rate will go up with ESD. So you have a perforation rate that go from 0% with EMR to 8% with ESD. Bleeding goes from 0 to uh, 2%. When you look at the uh, recurrence rate, however, with EMR, it's going to be higher due to either incomplete resection or piecemeal resection. Uh, when you employ the ESD or the specialized version of EMR, which allow for more in block resection, the recurrence rate is lower. Now, finally, I would like to end with some case illustration uh, of interesting cases. Uh, this is the case I showed uh, earlier. Uh, which was referred for right hemicolectomy. As you see here, we have a very bulky region over five centimeter occupying a good percentage of the lumen. And, um, this is how it looks immediately after resection. This took approximately 90 minutes to achieve. The lesion was completely resected. And uh, as you see here, we've done serial closure of the uh, polypectomy uh, defect as, uh, as shown here. We also tattoo the area so we can uh, take a look at the area. The final pathology was predominantly tumor villus adenoma with few foci of carcinoma in situ. So uh, this patient uh, was advised to have a repeat colonoscopy in four months just to check the polypectomy site. Now this is an interesting case. This patient had undergone a low anterior resection uh, already and had a carcinoma in situ recurrence at the anastomosis as uh, shown here. So this is a localized carcinoma uh, right at the level of the uh, anastomosis. And the patient was too high risk for uh, redo anterior resection um, with a potential need for a diverting uh, stoma. So sent to me for endoscopic management. Uh, you, these pictures are taken in August 23, 2011, where I resected the area and put some clips in areas where there was a micro perforation. Uh, when back January 2012, a few months later, you see a little bit of residual disease here, and uh, I go after it with a needle knife to go a little bit deeper. In the bottom slide, you see one of the staple at the tip of the needle knife. So I went really deep into the bowel wall to ensure I completely remove it. Uh, including the area of fibrosis. And um, this is in April. Uh, you see there's no evidence of recurrence. Uh, the lesion was completely removed and the patient managed uh, without the need for a, another anterior resection. Now, this was a uh, localized carcinoma uh, in situ as well. You could see the uh, central area of depression. This basically was evolving into more invasive lesion. I had to go deep with a needle knife and uh, lo and behold, there's an area here marked by the yellow, um, uh, the, the, the yellow arrow that shows an area of, again, focal perforation. Uh, this here is a close-up of that area. Fortunately, there was fat outside the colon in that area and I was able to manage endoscopically in the right colon without the need for surgical intervention. Uh, this was another uh, lesion in the ascending colon. Again, the ascending colon is the thinnest, and this is where, in my original series, um, I found most of the complication, 7%, as I described earlier. Um, I removed this lesion, and I see some darkness there, again, uh, pointed with a yellow arrow. Uh, this was an area of perforation, and I was able to clip and control endoscopically. And this was basically uh, the proof that there was a full thickness perforation because I got an abdominal film on the patient immediately after the procedure. You see a very large amount of free air. And you see here the clips in the right lower quadrant over the proximal ascending uh, colon. Uh, to ensure the safety of the patient, I did a CT scan of the abdomen with rectal contrast. The contrast went all the way to the area of perforation. As you see, there was no leakage of contrast, and this patient was basically managed uh, by decompressing the air with a needle tap. So I put a large IV bore catheter uh, into, through the abdominal wall into the 
uh, area of the pneumoperitoneum, I suctioned it for patient comfort and then managed the patient non-operatively and the patient did very well. This is a, another case uh, where it was a, a deep lesion and here I did an ESD with a, a full thickness excision with some uh, blood loss. I lost about two units. It's very important that uh, even though this is done in endoscopy suite, you need to work with a capable endoscopy uh, team uh, that can remain calm because some of these can have blood loss. Uh, we lost two units. I basically uh, had to insufflate a lot in order to wash the area of the bleed to control it. And uh, the patient did well was discharged home after the procedure uh, without any complication. Now, finally, we will talk about a modified technique called laparoendoscopic. Uh, this may be a useful technique for polyp that are either in a very difficult location, they come at an angle, and you can uh, perform these in the operating room uh, with an endoscopist and a surgeon. The surgeon can manipulate the lesion from the outside uh, to push it in full view of the scope so that it's easier to resect. Uh, in addition, added benefit and advantage is if there is any uh, perforation at the time of the endoscopic resection, it can be repaired uh, laparoscopically. So uh, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, uh, what we have been witnessing in the last decade or so, especially in highly specialized unit, is a paradigm shift from a mentality that most of us were trained to do organ resection for any colorectal neoplasm, including early one, to an organ preservation approach where we try to preserve the colon and only remove the lesion. Uh, we believe this technique will continue to evolve. Uh, it beats open surgery, it beats laparoscopy, it beats robotic surgery. It carries much less morbidity and certainly much less cost. The majority of cases I showed you have been done uh, on, the, on an outpatient basis without even admitting the patient, uh, especially in the US. In the UAE, some patient I admit overnight, but also many patient I discharge the same day. Uh, it does require significant surgical expertise to kind of determine which lesion should be approached uh, and a tremendous therapeutic endoscopy skills in order to carry out the procedure as safely as possible for the patient. And uh, with that, I, I do hope that this talk was very informative. Uh, this is the Museum of the Future, uh, which is about to be inaugurated and open here uh, in uh, Dubai. Uh, I do hope if you visit Dubai, you visit this beautiful Museum of the Future. And um, uh, should you have any question, you can reach me through uh, my website here in Dubai. Thank you very much.